Hello and welcome back to another War Tales guide. My name is Heiken and today we're going to take a look at the legendary weapons within the game. The arguably strongest weapons. I will go through each of the weapon categories and give you my thoughts on which weapon is best in slot for what particular build. So without further ado, let's jump right into the guide. As with most of uh, the guides that I'm doing, I'm trying to be as concise, precise, quick and on point as possible to save you time to give you more information. So the first category that we're going to look at is swords. And boy, oh boy, there are a lot of swords, legendary uh, swords in particular. So by far the class with the most legendary weapons is the swordsman. If you are running larger parties with multiple characters, consider maybe taking multiples of them to maximize the impact of it. There are so many swords within the game that you can't wield all of them. There are one, two, three, four, five one-handed swords and one two-handed sword. So generally speaking about uh, each of the weapons, and I'll uh, not repeat that for the other categories, uh, it very much depends on what your build is going to look like to determine what the best in-class uh, weapon is. For the uh, swordsman, I prefer defensive builds, really build them as the tank because they make excellent tanks, which means inherently I'm more drawn to one-hand swords. However, there is nothing wrong with a swordsmaster, good medium armor, uh, and then full aggro build that definitely works as well. Good. In terms of one-handed swords, let's take a look. We do have Mihith Kopis, which is a sword that you are um, getting relatively late in the normal game, uh, which has the special ability to deal uh, two uh, or to regain two Valor points upon defeating an enemy. Uh, the important part of that sword is it does have an 80 to 100 percent strength damage uh, ratio. You can see the damage of this character is 120 and the sword deals around uh, 100 to 120 points of damage. That is going to be very important because the way that a lot of the tanks work is they hyper focus on uh, the defensive repost and sometimes even if you want to go extra aggressive to a counter attack and essentially engage, disengage, engage, disengage. If you do have a low base damage weapon, then that strategy, those extra attacks will be a little bit wasted. Um, the fatal blow ability of uh, Mihir's Coppice is absolutely fantastic and for me it would be the best in class weapon or best in slot weapon. Rivaled by a couple of new weapons from the DLC, Groak uh, is a beautiful weapon that deals equally strong damage, but instead of gaining Valor points, it knocks the enemy back 3 meters. Now it's completely up to you if you uh, want to use that for the new DLC uh, to basically help pushing enemies overboard. It's a fantastic weapon for that. Groak is available relatively late in uh, the game um, when you're almost done with all of the boarding, but it's never too late to push someone over uh, the edge. Maelstrom is an equally interesting weapon. Uh, this weapon uh, will attack uh, for a little bit lower damage, but applies bleeding, then deals uh, the damage again to the target and knocks them back by 4 meters. So very similar to um, Groak, but distinctly a little bit different because the bleeding part, some enemies will be immune and for attacks of opportunity it won't be as good. So an okay weapon, but not as good as Groak or Meteorscopis. Uh, Kling Sword is the hidden weapon that you can get uh, from uh, the Dronbach uh, region. Essentially, if you don't know uh, where to get it, uh, you need to go all the way up here into the Forgotten Cave and uh, use a couple of uh, Blanch Bombs in order to destroy a couple of stones there to get the weapon. Uh, nice, we uh, nice weapon, you can uh, definitely work with it. It takes three times, it's ultra fast, but the problem with that is also it has ultra low damage. So for any form of attack of opportunity, not useful. But if you do have a build that wants to stack, for instance, poison stacks, then this weapon is definitely good. 
Next up, Glory, which is a good one-handed sword that deals around 60 to 80% of the damage. If already engaged in combat, you gain protection. In theory, a good weapon, and I've used it for a while. The problem with that weapon in particular is that uh, there are uh, abilities like uh, Bulwark. Every time this unit engages in combat, they get deflection automatically. And there are other oils, such as the defensive oil, which emulate protection. So the add-on of this weapon that it um, offers isn't as great as uh, the uh, appeal might be so it is definitely a fine tank weapon and for pure tanking purposes it's absolutely okay but if you want to maximize a little bit more damage later in the game um, i would only put it into b tier rating so in terms of just quality of the weapons i would go methyscopies over groak maelstrom glory and click sword finally two-handed weapon prosperity very strong uh, weapon which deals a lot of damage to all uh, units in the area also knocking them back two meters so that weapon in itself is good for any f uh, form of boarding and just generally any uh, damage units that could not be knocked back there are a couple of uh, immovable units for instance uh, will take 150 percent extra damage alternatively if you have already engaged the unit on one end and you're trying to knock them back into your own people that wouldn't work either so with a little bit clever positioning you can do a lot of damage with prosperity i would give it an all-around solid rating but i already mentioned personally uh, swordsmen are a little bit more defensive from my perspective moving on to the brute uh, which is the second defensive character i like to play my brute as a tank potentially or arguably the strongest tank in the game simply because it does have uh, the protection ability compared uh, or combined with uh, deflection repost and just overall incredible defensive strengths so the character is a massive massive bulwark and if you look at the other alternatives besides destroyer really brawler and uh, smasher in my perspective aren't uh, good enough to justify moving away from a tank build and let's not get started on vanguard that's really not my favorite spec to begin with so i would always build them as a tank however the game offers you a couple of alternatives in terms of just pure mace weapons uh, there is one one-handed weapon which is uh, erkanesh's mace uh, a legendary mace that you get from uh, defeating Urkanish, uh, which is the best in slot weapon for that class. Upgrade it, love it, it is fantastic. Deals around uh, 60 to 80 percent damage, but if this unit has more strength than the target, the damage dealt is doubled and it guarantees a critical hit. So, uh, many of the opposing tanks won't have as much strength as you do, specifically if you regularly upgrade these weapons, which means you have per definition 100 percent crit rate, which is fantastic. Uh, critting with every single strike is very, very strong. That means you can uh, reduce uh, the crit chance itself because uh, Erkarish is just taking care of it. There are two two-handed uh, weapons that I want to draw your attention to. One is Dagon's Hammer, potentially the first legendary weapon that you will find in Tilgren's area, and then the Bog Thunder. Both of them have their own... Um, place or their own um, position in the game if you're going for a brawler build or if you're going for a smasher build then of course these weapons can work dagan's hammer in particular is interesting uh, deals uh, around 50 percent damage to all units in the area if one or more unit takes damage it strikes two more times so it is a multi-attack weapon per definition and it to a degree emulates the executioner skill uh, that uh, the ex-wielder uh, has or the executioner has so i will give it credit for that it can deal a lot of damage in its own right however 
it is pale in comparison to the executioner for multiple uh, reasons the class just doesn't lend itself so well to multi-attack damage uh, the fun weapon is the bog thunder which you can get in the swamp lands uh, the weapon itself deals okay points of damage so kind of uh, the same 30 to 50 percent uh, damage ratio but if you hit the mosquito the damage is increased by a thousand percent so for whatever reason if you feel like you want to use second weapon and swap it during mid combat uh, so that you always do have that second weapon available by all means knock yourself out uh, the few times that you are going to fight mosquitoes this is going to be the best character in the game and for that niche it gets a kind of c tier ultra good in one regard and not so good in in the other situations moving on to axes and this game does have a couple of them two one-handed axes and two two-handed axes to be precise depending on um, the type of character that you want to play typically axe wielding characters are either berserkers or executioners berserkers for single uh, target dps executioners arguably the best multi-target dps in the game with challenging shout that pulls everything together and then you just rotate uh, and spin around until everything is dead now let's talk about the two different builds if you want uh, to build a berserker you're looking for the maximum damage that you can deal and you do have two options available one is devotion and one is napti's axe both have very different ideas in mind so devotion itself deals around uh, 80 to 100 percent damage but stacks rage so that is the classical full uh, target single target damage niche great for any fight boss fight that you're having great for arena fights that you're having great for any fight that has uh, reinforcements the end fights and drumbuck absolutely massive weapon because you build up rage and i have had situations where characters have up to 20 points of rage and boy oh boy it's just going to uh, be nutty at that point so it's a good weapon in this regard my criticism to it is in real game terms that doesn't happen all too often more often than not the fights are over after two rounds so you want to make sure that those two rounds count which is where Nepti's Axe uh, comes in handy. Nepti's Axe deals a flat 80% damage, so a little bit less uh, than that. But the enemy loses um, two corrosion, so that's 30% of their maximum armor, and get poison stacks on top of it. So if you just hit often enough, uh, that means um, the, uh, the ber Berserker can really be a tank killer. So if you do have any form of multi-poison build that you are using, for instance, your uh, assassin, respectively uh, poison uh, poisoner, so your ranger, is running a poison based build where you can uh, double poison if you're on top of that putting poison oil on top of the weapon this can actually be quite strong because all of a sudden with multi attacks you're ending up uh, dishing out a lot of damage and uh, the specifically high hit point targets uh, polar bears bears in general uh, the wild hunt and so on and so forth are you uh, losing a lot of uh, hit points just by being poisoned there's a slight warning though uh, any form of infected creature uh, will heal from poison so the weapon clearly isn't as good as uh, against those creatures but overall it does have its place i would say i prefer devotion over an empty sex um but only with a slight preference which brings us to the two hand axes where Endiel's great axe which is a an axe that you uh, will find in the new dlc pirates of Deler uh, Belerian, or splitter which is literally the second weapon that uh, you are finding um, in the Valtrus area uh, both of them are good weapons in their own regards and when you look at the two-handed build what you want to do primarily is you want challenging shout to apply fragility to everybody and then you want to use cutting maelstrom in the first round hitting as many as possible and since any good build would have recklessness where the first attack also deals an additional 150 points of damage that means the first uh, cutting maelstrom actually deals 250 percent damage so in 
instead of 66 points of damage, we're looking more into the 150 points of base damage that doesn't include crit, my, uh, mind you. So what that means is that we want to have a high hit point or a high damage dealing weapon. And if you compare both of them, there are pros and cons. And I would actually say they both um, come in equally good. So for the vast majority of the time I was using Splitter. Splitter basically has a 100% uh, damage uh, ratio. Uh, so that is very good in itself. 166 uh, points of damage in this case. Uh, it's not 100%, it's 80-90% flat uh, damage ratio. But it does have an additional on um, hit trigger which is called Bloodshed. So uh, Bloodshed will deal the same amount of damage in the enemy's turn. So there is kind of a stacked uh, delayed extra damage. Mind you, that happens directly to hit points. So if you're running a build uh, where you, for instance, uh, put the oil on that directly deals hit point damage, you can completely ignore guard to a degree because you're directly going for hit point damage with both of it. Now, there is a bit of a problem with it that I found out whilst playing the game, uh, whilst the extra bleeding damage is nice, the enemy still gets a turn so that always irked me a little bit and that's where Enel's Great X uh, tries to fill a little bit uh, more of that spot towards the end game when you have a higher crit rating mind you currently we have zero suspicion I'm typically running around with five suspicion which brings the crit chance to a hundred percent for every single hit that you're doing, you're getting an extra uh, fervor, which increases the damage by 10%. So although the first iteration of damage with uh, fervor will only be 130 instead of 160, the second spin already will include a nice 10% bonus. And from the third spin onwards, we are at exactly the 160 points of damage. So all you need to do is in the first round hit three enemies with your spin if you kill them and there are extra spins all power to you because you will get more critical strikes and that will generate more fear fervor i've seen as much as five six stacks of fervor in the first round absolutely phenomenal weapon so the way that i would categorize this is splitter over the uh, period of leveling a little bit better because more upfront damage and then later you transition into endless great x because there you really do have the advantage of uh, fully leveraging 100 percent crit rate which nicely brings us to the spear class in this case i'm running a halibadier there are two general builds for the spear class or the, for the spear wielder. One is the Harpenier, where you're trying to just maximize the on-hit um, effects that are happening through multiple enemies. And the second one is the Halibaldir, which is an executioner with a higher maximum damage, but lower average damage because uh, you don't have a positioning skill. So with that in mind, choose your weapon carefully we do have three weapons actually we only do have two weapons in the current state of the game uh, the one weapon would be Harun's partisan which is um, the arena reward from uh, beating the team Harun um, and uh, no no it's a tomb um, reward what am I saying um, together with uh, Harun's bow uh, it is a combination and basically what it does is it deals um, a solid 80 to 90 percent damage and puts the mark of uh, Narciss on, um, uh, puts the mark of Harun on. Uh, the mark of Harun means the moment that someone hits it with a bow, they generate two Valor. Um, if uh, the mark of Narciss is uh, running, there's an extra attack of opportunity happening. So that's kind of uh, the give and, uh, give and take combo. If you ever had like world bosses with ultra high hit points, that would be a nice combo. The reality is it doesn't happen too often unless you're a harpenier and you're just um, trying to um, hit one target then hit the other um, three four targets uh, with your harpoon apply a lot of damage and then hope your um, your archer just snipes the target so the combo here in uh, that two weapon set isn't working as well however that doesn't mean that the weapon itself isn't really really good 80 to 90 percent uh, strength damage is absolutely solid and even though the mark only happens uh, every so often it's still a good weapon however i think liberator is a little bit better 
Liberator comes in at a solid uh, at this, a solid 90% mark uh, full stop, but it does have a couple of extra options. Uh, it resets uh, the attack skill when you are already engaged. So what is going to happen there is if you find yourself in an engagement, you can hit with uh, the Liberator, it liberates you and uh, on top of it, it resets the skill. If you nicely put that together uh, with a Sweet Spot where you destabilize uh, the enemy and re post uh, where you get counter attacks as well as put oils on it like hardening oil where you are in position uh, after the first round you can put up your guard very much into a nice little tanking location so what happens is enemy will uh, engage you you immediately strike back you take very little damage on top of it then next round comes along and liberator can be used in order to push the enemy away you get an extra attack uh, on top of it because uh, the skill of liberator really resets itself you can partially abuse it with uh, going in with another taunt and then uh, continuing to use the combination um, I'm not sure if they are going to patch it, so don't quote me on that. Liberator, definitely a little bit better weapon than Haroon's Partisan. Honorable mention for Balerion Spear, which is a legendary weapon that you get in the Balerion's questline. Unfortunately, currently it doesn't have the tech upgradable, therefore not really that good. However, uh, if it was upgradable, it applies destabilization to everything in uh, one round. Um, I would need to do testing. I've not done that because the weapon at the moment is not competitive but i would need to do testing if that works together with harpenier or if that's just a normal stunning assault if it's just a normal stunning assault then it's a pure replica of uh, the sweet spot and therefore completely obsolete uh, if it works with harpenier you could do something with that hitting multiple tanks but in the current um, quote-unquote meta, this weapon just deal, does nothing. So I would suggest use Liberator if you have a second Spearman, use Harun's Partisan. That's it. Moving on to the Pugilist, who does have currently two legendary weapons. One is Ripper and one is called Sipur Katar. Ripper is the arena reward, Sipur Katar is a unique reward from a quest. So both of them definitely have their individual place and interesting dynamics uh, to uh, say the least. For starters, let's start with the pros and cons. So Ripper itself comes in with a very, very nice 40% uh, damage ratio which for fist weapons is great because keep in mind you're always attacking two to three times so it's really really good to have such a high base damage and it does have an interesting mechanic in itself which is called delirium and i would say that's the strongest mechanic if the games go lo uh, if the fights go long that i've so far seen essentially if you continue attacking in defensive stance you build up delirium that's a permanent buff that uh, will last until the end of the fight Fight. and if you then switch to a attack stance at some point you will get a number of extra attacks for every application of delirium allowing you to hit 10 12 times if the uh, fight is long enough so that in itself is a great mechanic in reality it plays out a little bit uh, more shallow than that i've had many uh, fights where we started with um, defensive stance a lot of uh, attacks with, uh, in the first round and then just getting like these two extra attacks in the second round it's nice it's not um, completely overpowered uh, but the weapon itself is good where it starts becoming very very strong is from level 12 onwards when you do have the thrashing because thrashing kind of seem to be balanced around um, lower damage weapons and ripper really is a very high dps weapon and from what i've tested i even have a youtube shorts on uh, that one you can deal up to 5000 damage uh, completely unbuffed just with uh, thrashing so you delete one enemy period he's just gone um, on top of it, uh, if you uh, do it in defensive stance, you can even heal yourself quite substantially with every attack. So uh, the weapon Ripper definitely S tier at the moment. Sipo Qatar, I would say kind of solid B tier. Uh, the um, inbuilt features here is if you do have a lot of debuffs on the target, you attack one more time per debuff. So that kind of then asks what's the ki what's the setup that you are playing. I could see a setup where, let's say, the uh, ranger is responsible for just putting up a lot of debuffs. 
kind of a poison build with a alchemistic offhand, um, throwing in uh, poison, then throwing in burning um, effect uh, to everyone, um, and uh, putting an AOE bleed on uh, on top of it, so that there are already three um, debuffs. If you add uh, legendary um, items to that, like the new trinket that you're uh, getting in the DLC, where you basically uh, do have a free debuff on top of everything. Here it is, Sea Serpent Scale, uh, which is called Irritation. Then I can see that that weapon becomes good because all of a sudden you do have uh, four debuffs on a pretty sizable amount of enemies. Um, and if you stack for whatever reason even more debuffs slow and, and so on and so forth or have a couple of weapon effects trigger then you would uh, you would start uh, with eight attacks um, from the get-go so then the brutal bra uh, bravato still becomes very very good um, if you stack additional um, debuffs on top of it, put um, poison um, and bleeding, for instance, on your weapon and just continue to hit, 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 and stack more debuffs, uh, that wouldn't be uh, too bad. So I can uh, see a world where that weapon is good, but it requires very specific builds. Moving on to the daggers, pointy, pointy things. We do have three daggers and two offense to review for the ranger. For starters, I would assume that most of the uh, people that play either use the assassin spec or the poisoner spec. The other two are sort of meh. You can use them in specific contexts, but the poisoner is basically multi-application of poison and other debuffs, whilst the assassin is solo target uh, DPS with a strong uh, affiliation towards bleeding. And depending on what you want to play, I would say the weapon specifically ties out to that. So um, the uh, weapon that I would favor most highly is Krupa Sax, uh, which is a great dagger that you're getting in Dornbach very late in the game. It comes in with 80 to 100 uh, percent damage and it applies one poison as well as a slowdown and the slow reflexes. So massive, massive uh, debuff. The point being is so late in the game, typically the assassin kills an enemy instead of debuffing uh, them. So it's funny that this weapon has so much debuff potential on top of such a high base DPS. If you uh, put uh, uh, then abilities like sharpening oil and putrid on the weapon, then it just deals even more damage. So very, very strong contender for one of the strongest weapons in the game. Uh, Beard eats Chris. Uh, and a nice weapon as well comes in with just around uh, 50 to 60 percent of damage um, in the damage increased by 100 percent if no uh, none of uh, the targets uh, targets allies are within four meters so that's a perfect weapon if you want to specialize in attacking the back line and if you do have a lot of abilities that allow y yourself or others to position enemies um, pushing uh, pushback shots, um, switch arounds, uh, just generally positioning uh, abilities work wonders with Beardy's Chris. My logic always was yes, the up, uh, upside of an isolated enemy can be higher because all of a sudden you have 60% of damage times two, but the reality is specifically with denser maps you will see a lot of enemies that are clustered up so more often than not you will find yourself more at 60 percent of damage instead of a hundred and twenty percent of damage which is why i would put it into b tier uh, situational but if you can make it work then that is fantastic viper as a dagger uh, would also range in B to C tier. I've never really made it work. So here's the thing. Uh, Viper comes in with a 50% uh, damage ratio instead of that solid 80 to 100% uh, snacky ratio that we have seen from Crop of Sex. Uh, the Viper Dagger, however, has a couple of special uh, features. Um, most particular is all poison stacks that are applied to the target increase the damage by 25% per application, which means if you run with four poison stacks, that's already 100% uh, damage to the blade. Now, the point that um, I don't like uh, with uh, the toxic blade is 
it consumes all of the poison sticks and that is where i think the weapon falls a little bit short i do understand a bit of the design logic they didn't want to kind of double dip uh, on that but you really need uh, to have a lot of poison sticks and think about it that way in order to make that work uh, to even break even on the damage to Krupus X, you already need uh, four. Um, you already need four uh, poison sticks. In order to have a little bit more damage than Krupus X, you need kind of eight poison sticks. So how are you going to get that realistically? You would need to be a poisoner for four stacks, right? And then you would need to have explosive gas to double the poison sticks on all units. On top of that, you would need to find ways of either running two assassins uh, one that is just poisoning and the other one that is then cleaning up but if you do have eight poison sticks on the enemy that's already 40 percent of their hit points in damage next round so i'm not 100 percent sure if viper really is such a good deal yes you could kill the enemy before it's their turn but the uh, the consuming of all poison sticks and the kind of um, prolifically low base damage doesn't really inspire like ultra high crits in uh, in a regular fashion typically you're going to see really solid damage but it requires you to use poisoning in some shape or form however that being said i actually think that the poisoner build still is incredibly good and if you are willing to put in the extra time to grind a couple of um, alchemical uh, reagents then you can have offhands that uh, throw very very well and apply additional um, debuffs just killing um, massive uh, tanks from the enemy in one go because if you do have two uh, two poisoners in the team and you do have um, uh, you do have the ability to always double poison stacks believe me that stacks up very very fast and 20 poison stacks is an insta kill so um, that has nothing to do with uh, the weapon itself, but more with the build. Coming to the offhands, we do a faceless in progress. So I talked about how poisoners tend to want to use alchemical weapons. Assassins, on the other hand, want to use high damage offhand weapons. And that is really where faceless um, and progress come in. Those weapons can't be upgraded. I think it's a bit of an oversight. They should allow that. Faithless is a non-depletable legendary weapon progress equally. Both of them fantastic in their own regards. Both of them offer an extra throw. And if you combine it with instinctive thrower, you get two throws out of it. Uh, you might have seen it in my other videos. They crit in the end game for 120 a pop. So that means just as a rider effect on every single skill, mind you, the skill doesn't need to deal damage, you get 240 points of damage worth of damage uh, just from that offhand. So that is crazy. Even uh, skills like uh, the Song of the Ancients that you can use via your trinket will trigger that skill. Even picking up a flower triggers that skill. Uh, searching for an exit, a door, swinging um, uh, on a boarding ship, all of that triggers the skill. Um, it's wonderful. Faces is a S tier item in itself. Crit damage plus 10, critical uh, hit chance plus, uh, uh, plus 10. Um, and I would even put progress just because it is so good in S minus tier. The only reason why it's S minus is because uh, Faithless exi uh, exists and has double the stats. But there is no reason not to use both if you do have two assassins. Anyways, moving on to the last class, which would be the hunter or the archer rather. Um, there are three bows in the game, uh, two which are currently carried by my archers and one that we are having um, as a reserve. Let's look at them in, uh, in order. There's the indomitable one, which is a solid kind of 70% damage AOE, uh, sorry, 50% uh, damage AOE weapon. Then we do have Narsis Bow, which is a 60 to 100% uh, percent, um, damage uh, bow, which is the um, counter item to the spear that we were discussing earlier. And then finally, we do have Slythe, uh, which again is a relatively moderate uh, weapon, but it uh, works together with, anim uh, with animal companions. Bows have for a long period of time also had war bows as one of their strong contenders. They are not a uh, legendary weapon, but they are. 
a rare upgradable weapon that you could uh, get. The Liberator is one of uh, these bows and essentially the first hit on a non-injured um, enemy always crits and uh, will allow a second hit. That is good, however, it very much diminishes later in the game uh, where you can one-shot enemies, where all of a sudden that ability isn't that good. So whilst the bow is incredibly strong during leveling, uh, the legendary bows actually become stronger towards the end game. Indomitable one would be, in my perspective, the strongest bow, mainly because although it is only 60% uh, damage, uh, it offers the ability to hit multiple targets and on crit uh, it puts enemies on their uh, toe, uh, back uh, foot, pushes them back and they lose 10% of their maximum health. Well, with 100% crit uh, chance, that means they always will be pushed back, you always will let them lose extra health and you always hit at least two enemies, which is a fantastic um, uptime in damage. If you um, use extra items, just like the Trophy of Legends that you can get from uh, the Arena of Legends, you can even shoot twice with uh, the piercing arrows, dealing an enormous amount of damage. For hunters in particular, the recoil shot uh, doesn't uh, necessarily require your weapon to be high damage and since you're not using attacks of opportunity, you don't need a high damage weapon per se. So the recoil shot uh, deals just as much damage with that weapon as uh, the piercing arrows would. So indomitable one, definitely an S tier weapon. Shortly followed after that is the Nar uh, Narciss bow where uh, the uh, weapon itself deals 60 to 100 uh, percent damage and has that nice interaction uh, with uh, the spear where you can generate extra uh, uh, valor by killing enemies or hitting enemies that do have the mark of Faroon uh, on them. The weapon itself is super um, solid and the reason why I would put it into A tier is because it deals a lot of damage. You can uh, very much upgrade the weapon. It's always going to be a very competent um, uh, weapon to uh, to fight with. And on top of it, it has that um, nice Mark of Harun, Mark of Narses um, interaction, which I just see as a bonus at this point. Which then brings us to uh, Sloith, which kind of is in C tier, mainly because I'm not the biggest fan of animal companions. Animal companions uh, overproportionally increase the size of the enemy parties, therefore dragging out uh, fights. And they on themselves are not particularly impressive. So although um, animal companions can be fun, they unfortunately increase enemies' uh, sizes and therefore are not particularly good. The weapon deals 40 to 60-70% of damage and all allied enemies next to the target execute an attack of opportunity. Well, in theory that is great because you can put, uh, put in the bears uh, to the front line um, in a way that you still can shoot through them or you put uh, the archer right uh, behind the bears. You shoot the target, uh, bears attack and um, with the attacks of opportunity the target is just being splattered. So far, the theory, the, pra uh, the practical application um, didn't show that result really. Very seldomly did that combination work and therefore, in my perspective, the, this is uh, at best a niche application. If I was to redesign the bow, I would give it a 80 to 100% uh, damage, just make it as strong as other bows and the bestial shot at, in itself is at best kind of a niche gimmick or alternatively if no beast is around apply vulnerability something along those lines to really make it a decent legendary but that already goes into how do i fix weapon territory which is not what that video is about i hope you liked the overview about all of the legendary weapons I had a bit of an understanding of why to use which legendary and um, you might want to let me know if i was wrong in one of the evaluations what are your thoughts any weapon that you particularly like that I've overseen, any weapon that uh, surprised you, any thoughts around the builds of how you would approach it. Let me know in the comments down below and see you in the next guide. Take care. Bye bye.